you know, you have to kind of move some things around there. Okay, uh, so first of all, thank you so much, uh, Ellen, and to the conference committee uh, for this invitation. Um, I'm going to speak for about 11 <laughs> to 12 minutes, but I promise it won't go over that, Ellen. Um, so uh, I was asked to speak in this um, session on urban sound environments, which I'm really delighted to share with Laden. Uh, in the context of re-examining Schaefer's musical and sonic ecologies. So I'd like to look at some concepts and methods that were developed by Schaefer in the World Soundscape Project in the realm of urban soundscapes in the late 1960s, early 70s, and then the intellectual trajectories that develop in relation to that work, uh, particularly in the realm of sound mapping, acoustic communities, sound walking. Um, this is coming out of an ERC funded project, which is called Sun Cities, uh, which has many collaborators. Uh, so this is all um, our collaborative work. And you can check this out at sunsities.org. So when I think of Schaefer and the sound of cities, this is the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, he included in this in his 1970 book of noise and it's a decibel table. And what he says is, uh, this is a portrait of your city, listen to it closely. Um, and he basically says there are all these sounds of technology which are becoming louder in cities, um, that the average uh, sound level of a city is rising by a decibel per year. And then he says, the modern, modern city has become a sonic battleground. Man is losing. So this was uh, Schaefer's earliest publication on cities and soundscapes. And it's really formed around the concept of noise pollution. Now, there have been critiques as to the anti-modern and anti-urban tendencies in Schaefer, which I'm not going to point you towards this um, some references, and maybe I'll send Ellen the, you know, my full bibliography uh, for the resources section of the website, if that uh, would be useful. Um, so, but I think it's important to understand the original impulse behind that research, which is ecological, about preserving environments and protecting the human voice. Um, so in the 1930s, if we look at early noise legislation, it's really uh, around eliminating individual noise sources, uh, whereas by the 1960s, there's this emergent concept of noise pollution, which is not localizable to a specific source, but uh, something which is everywhere, it's in the air, and it's damaging entire ecosystems. But there's also this idea of noise as being lethal. So this is, um, I thought this image was a nice, you know, encapsulation of this idea that noise is everywhere, it's inside the human organism. Um, and they cite this study that uh, they're doing these noise tests on laboratory animals, um, and the animals are suffering from burns and spasms and paralysis. Um, so if we look back at the 1930s, this uh, portrait of New York City, uh, acoustic city of New York, um, commissioned by the Noise Abatement Commission, the decibel levels go up to 113. If we look at uh, this uh, from the Columbia Law Review, it was probably the most important um, piece of writing around noise legislation of this period, same year as Schaefer 1970. Uh, you see this whole kind of lethal level, uh, which is a new level that's coming up in the 1960s. It's post-World War II. And so there's this whole kind of noise weapon uh, level. So Schaefer's interest in the sonic ecologies of cities emerges in this moment in which there is increasing attention to, and one could say hysteria around noise pollution as something which is potentially lethal. Uh, so decibel tables, this is something I look at in my book, Stereophonica. Um, they're a way of visualizing urban soundscapes and noise scapes and closely linked to the development of sound maps and noise maps. And Schaefer and the WSP do some very important early work in that regard. Um, and it's, I think, important to look at those visualizations also because they really do uh, influence noise legislation. So for example, this is an early noise map, isobel map, uh, drawn by the World Soundscape Project. Uh, it's this kind of systematic noise level reading of this Vancouver park, or this is a qualitative versus quantitative uh, sound map, which is describing the sounds heard in a place. Uh, this is from their Five Village Soundscapes uh, project. 
But since then, we've had a real proliferation of urban sound maps, many of which are online, interactive, participatory, and um, usually consisting of audio recordings which are pinned onto an online map powered by Google Maps, for example. Um, this is the Montreal Soundscape, which is a sound map, which is a you know project that I think is really interesting. But there have been a lot of criticisms um, about sound mapping that have emerged maybe in the last 10 years. So Jackie Waldock raises this very important issue with regards to this kind of genre, which comes out of some of these early uh, sound maps. Um, and she says, you know, what is often being constructed is a male dominated record of sound. Milena Drumeba talks about um, this, she proposes this idea of critical sound mapping and she questions what she calls the normative logics embedded in the practice of sound mapping, which she identifies as a high quality field recording, a branch of high fidelity culture that operates as a masculine technological domain. And I'll also point you towards Samuel Thulin's paper on that. So if we look at some maybe alternative examples that are kind of countering these uh, traditions or logics, uh, this is a work by Anna Raimondo. She's now done a big series of these urban sound maps. This one has an installation as well as a map. Um, and here she's really asking women about their experiences of the city. So she's producing this kind of counter narrative of different cities by asking women in particular, queer women, transgender, ethnic minority and refugee women to share their experiences of the city. And what emerges are a lot of experiences of marginalization, harassment and exclusion from so-called public space. Um, so her project is really in response to the work of the feminist geographer, Julian Rose, who's thinking about the geographer's gaze as this kind of visual ideology, which is uncritically showing only the relationship of the powerful to their environment, uh, she writes. And I think there's a similar impulse that we could say has driven soundscape composition traditions and field recording traditions in which it has often been a white male recordist's inaudible body, which is capturing this acoustic uh, exotic acoustic scene. And I was grateful to Leah for pointing out some of the you know, difficulties in this tradition. But so there is a parallel here, I think that we can draw between the geographer's gaze and the field recordist's ear. And you know, we should ask what are the sonic ideologies underpinning these traditions like field recording and sound mapping. And another example of a kind of sonic counter map is Alison Martin's project, which is showing the displacement of go-go -go music, which he describes as this uh, indigenous black um, urban music in Washington, DC, as there is increasing gentrification uh, in DC and those communities are being pushed out. So these kind of sonic counter mappings are, you know, telling kind of alternative narratives of the city and looking at stories that aren't told about the city. So um, in sound studies, there's been this uh, long tradition of cataloging urban sound environments. Uh, so the sounds that can be heard in a city, uh, collecting, recording, analyzing those sounds. Um, but I'm really interested in this kind of work, which is looking at the urban sound environment as a contested site, not a neutral place, but a contested place um, where the contests are often formed in connection to sociocultural differences like gender or race and how those are intersecting with and mediating definitions and enforcements of noise. Um, and there I'd point you to Trip to Chandola's amazing dissertation, which is on classed definitions of noise in New Delhi. Um, so whereas in soundscape studies, there's been this predominating logic of the soundscape as an object, um, you know, I think these kinds of projects are really thinking about soundscape as product, as something which is socially and culturally produced. And, you know, they invite us to consider not only which sounds are present in a city, but why they are present or absent. Uh, so what are the social and political and economic forces that are enabling certain soundscapes to emerge and develop and become the dominant soundscapes of a place or else that are forcing their, let's say, early demise? Um, and you can think of many different kinds of things like gentrification, population displacement, genocide, and many forms of expulsion. 
which are concentrated often upon urban populations. Um, so can we think of sound, urban soundscape analysis not only as cataloging the sounds of a city, but as examining the uh, social and political bases of these sonic spatial productions? There's another concept uh, that I want to look at, which is the acoustic community, or a kind of sister concept to that, the sonic commons. Uh, and these are often posited as a kind of unifying space and a unified sociality. So a unified community, which is sharing a sonic, uh, common sonic horizon, and I'm borrowing a term from Blesser and Salter. Uh, so something we're doing in Son Cities is thinking about sonic undercommons, so that sonic environments can be divided and fractional and exclusionary and segregated, even as they might be physically shared. Um, so investigating how urban sound environments can form sites of community and belonging, but also sites of conflict and division and exclusion, as well as resistance. Um, so Schaefer's racism toward indigenous people and musical cultures, there have been powerful uh, critiques of that, including by Dylan Robinson, who's speaking today. Um, and I think that is also you know, linked to this spatial logic of segregation and dispossession, which is more broadly shaping Canadian society, uh, in which, for example, reservations are thought of as distinct from other Canadian land, and in particular cities. Um, and that obscures the fact that all that land, including the most built up parts of the cities, are indigenous, indigenous land. So something that we can do as sound historians and theorists is to examine those displacements, dispossessions, and exclusions uh, in connection to the sonic realm and critically engaged with the spatial logics that govern ideas of what a city is. Um, against what and against whom is a city defined? Um, and there's another concept of sound walking, which is a very resonant concept uh, that emerges from the WSP. It's very central to urban sound studies. And in that discourse, it's often celebrated as this means towards producing this kind of sensorially rich understanding of a sonic environment. So for example, embodying a sonic choreography of a city by walking the sonic city. Um, so just recently, I've been working on a piece which is about sonic memories of the Armenian genocide and death marches and walking as a means of extermination and torture. This was happening in 1915. Um, and I'm looking at the sonic memories of survivors from oral testimonies. Um, and there is a very, very different idea of sound that emerges there in connection to walking as torture. So that makes me ask, you know, what archives and testimonies are missing from our canons? So to conclude or not conclude, <laughs> um, the work of Schaefer and the WSP, you know, has been very resonant. It's been foundational to sound studies and soundscape studies. It's also been reproduced and canonized uh, in different ways. But you can see from some of the intellectual and artistic trajectories um, that develop from it, they can be extensions or departures or critiques. And I think the work of the humanities and the arts uh, really is about reevaluating concepts and being in critical dialogue uh, with these concepts. Um, otherwise, they become entrenched uh, knowledges. Um, so for me, today's study day is really an opportunity to destabilize some of these concepts and methods uh, and pointing us towards the possibility that there are ways of knowing that we haven't even uh, yet considered or that have been obscured. So I'll sh stop sharing that now. Thank you so much. Uh, what a wonderful presentation. Um, lots to think about. Uh, we'll, we'll move on to, to Loudon Notion. <laughs> and you can show your screen again, but I've spotlit you, Loudon. So uh, that should be working in a moment. I will okay. turn my camera off and uh, share Loudon's screen. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Garcia, for a um, very thought-provoking uh, preceding talk to mine. Thank you so much. Um, so first, I'd like to uh, thank Ellen and her team for the invitation to speak um, at this wonderful event. I'm delighted to be here. 
Um, as Ellen has already alluded to, my talk is not directly about Schaefer's work, but will introduce an urban sounds project that is rooted in the wider field that um, has been shaped by it. Um, but first I'd like to offer a rather different kind of land acknowledgement um, from my perspective living in a former uh, colonial power centre um, rather than a settler country. Although it's not yet common practice in the UK, I want to recognise the legacies of colonial rule, extractivism and violence to which we owe the historic and continuing influx of wealth on which our academic institutions have been built. Um, we're well overdue a proper reckoning of such legacies in the UK, um, but they are particularly relevant to my talk today due to many decades of neo-colonial resource extraction from Iran that fueled uh, the British econ economy for a long time, and also historic uh, political interference, the consequences of which continue to play out today. So Tehran. Iran's largest and capital city is a vibrant metropolis of more than 8 million people cradled in the foothills of the Alborz Mountains and the country's political centre for over 200 years. Particularly significant was the period of Pahlavi rule from 1925 to 79 when an extensive programme of urban renewal led to the destruction of historic buildings regarded as symbolising the regressive traditionalism of the preceding Qajar monarchs. So Reza Shah Pahlavi envisioned a capital city fit for a nation that was modern, western facing and secular. And from the 1920s, the dominant discourses promoted the idea of modernity as somehow incompatible with traditional life ways and many aspects of the latter, including religion, were denigrated. The resulting tensions, which erupted in the 1979 revolution, can still be felt, um, seen and crucially heard in many areas of contemporary Iranian life. Uh, so, Garcia, next slide, please. Um, so my project, Sonic Tehran, um, uh, lies at the intersection of ethnomusicology, sound studies and urban studies and explores the city of Tehran through the lens of sound and a multi-sensory approach more generally. Through ethnographic engagement, it seeks to understand how the urban environment is both remembered and imagined sonically, with a focus on the relationship between sound, memory and affect. Through oral testimonies, interviews and conversations, including with architects and urban planners, through sonic diaries, sound walks and sound maps, and also using sound as a prompt for other memories. But the project is also about silences, the unsounded sounds and those that remain or are rendered unheard. This has obvious gender dimensions, but also relates to marginalised groups more generally, particularly given Iran's long history as a multi-ethnic, multi-faith and multi-linguistic ent entity. Um, and then there are the once but no longer sounded histories or, uh, yeah, of revolution, war and protest that continue to reverberate today. The project uh, engages directly with issues of power, so questions like who controls the sonic environment, which sounds dominate, who has the power to be heard, and what are the sonic resistances. So that's just a, a brief introduction. So when I think about this work in relation to Schaefer, two things immediately come to mind. First, my preference for the more nuanced concept of sound spaces rather than the somewhat totalising soundscapes. Second, my engage, and I'll come back to this notion of sound spaces uh, in a moment. Second, my engagement with the perhaps more problematic city sounds, so the incessant traffic or missile strikes during the Iran Iraq war, for instance. And I've uh, done ethnographic work on people's mem memories of that period in the 1980s. Um, so the first, uh, the traffic is, in, to my mind, intimately bound up with the broader sonics of Iran's new modernities. Um, from the late 19th and early 20th century centuries. And both, both of these examples are deeply implicated in what I call petrosonics, the sounds of oil, and impossible to separate from regional and global geopolitics. So because time is short, I will talk briefly about three aspects of the project or three um, concepts, if you like, that I'm um, exploring. So this is the next slide, Agassia, thanks. Um, what I call palimpsestic sound spaces, uh, sonic entanglements, and decentering methodologies. So I'll start with the last. 
Although I've been interested in the sounds of Tehran for the past two decades and have gathered much data during this time, it wasn't until early 2020 that I was able to start serious work on it, partly through a long overdue sabbatical and a research fellowship from the Leverhulme Trust. Unfortunately, this coincided both with COVID and with travel issues for British Iranian dual nationals. The plan had been to go to Tehran, conduct interviews and make recordings as I'd done previously. Um, and so since this uh, was, no, was not possible, uh, the, the funding clock started ticking and travel was still impossible, I had to rethink the project. This had various implications, not least for methodology. Um, for a start, due to working remotely, the, pro the project necessarily took on a more collaborative um, element than planned. Um, and this led fortuitously, but unintentionally, to the formation of a network. A research network and I, I can say more about this in the discussion if it's of interest. I, I was originally going to talk more about the network but um, since time was short I decided uh, not to. Um, exceptionally due to Covid I was allowed to convert travel funds, now, this wouldn't normally have been possible but I was able to tr convert travel funds to pay for research assistance and this was a project that had relatively small funding. I didn't have a project team or I didn't have funding for that but I was allowed to convert travel funds to pay for research assistance in Iran. So outcomes have included joint publications, um, we have monthly meetings online, various other um, online activities, but also I've been able to connect, connect members uh, in Iran uh, to an international academic network from which they are often marginalised and the normalisation of online meeting platforms has played an important role in this. So broadly speaking, working remotely has decentered me from the project in quite productive ways, I think. Effectively, the enforced circumstances became an opportunity to think more about decolonial methods. Um, and the project also became much more process focused. Um, th there's much more I could say about the methods we've been trying out, including online tools, multi-city sound walks and school workshops. But just to note that these collaborations are, of course, not without challenges. So publishing jointly with researchers in Iran means that I have to be even more careful about what I write. Simply collaborating with someone at a UK institution can carry risk. And due to international sanctions, it's actually very difficult to pay anyone in Iran. One strand of the project, another example, one strand of the project was supposed to focus on uh, environmental issues and climate change change. But this is such a politically charged topic in Iran at the moment that I had to pause that. Also, the current internet shutdown in Iran shows how fragile these connections are. I've had to cancel a series of interviews and the next, next monthly network meeting as a result. So due to all these particular circumstances um, and, and not being able to do sort of be there to do face-to-face -face ethnographic work as I'd uh, hoped, the project has also taken on a strong historical dimension which wasn't originally planned. Um, so for instance, I, the, the various things that I'm focusing on, one is the sounds of Tehran during World War II, when, it, when uh, Tehran, well, Iran was occupied by the Allies and it also became home to a large number of Polish refugees from Soviet labour camps. Or, for example, during the 1980s uh, Iran-Iraq war, um, including the sounds of missile strikes um, and refugees from the war zone. And I've done quite a lot of ethnographic work uh, remotely on, on these topics. I've become interested in um, what I call sonic palimpsests, or layers uh, of sound that accrue over time um, in particular spaces, and which, uh, which has also, also made me think about sound's intense materiality and the impression that it leaves on spaces, spaces, buildings and bodies, uh, notwithstanding its apparent immateriality. So one space that I'm looking at, um, this is the next slide, Gassia, one space that I'm looking at is the uh, Gas Museum and Gardens in Tehran, built in 1807 as a royal summer palace and that later fell into ruin and was rebuilt in the 1920s as Iran's first modern prison. Following the 1953 coup d'etat, Gas held political prisoners, some of whom I have interviewed about their sonic and other sensory memories. Gastr is now a museum and a park, which I visited. You can see some photos there um, from 2015. They sort of reconstructed some of the cells and, and so on, um, which I visited and in which sound is being used in quite interesting ways within the museum. 
So one of my questions is, where do such historic sounds and their material residues go? Might they continue to resonate in spaces today, rather like the cosmic after effects of the Big Bang? Another interesting space, um, this is the next slide um, that I'm looking at, is the former red light district uh, known as Gal E, which was burnt down during the 1979 revolution and the area transformed into a peaceful public park that belies the dark history of the space and its sounds. So uh, members of the Sonic Turner uh, Network have conducted sound walks here, um, reflecting and imagining its historic sonic footprints. And in fact, imagination is an important part of this project and has prompted me to think more generally about the role of imagination in our work. I'm interested not, in, not just in how the past is remembered sonically, but how it is reimagined, for instance, through filmic representations or historic walks. And one, one example of these is called Sayore. Um, this is the next slide, uh, Gassia. This is a, a screenshot from the Sayore website. Um, obviously, it's all in Persian. Sorry, I didn't have time to translate. Um, but I'll, I'll explain what it is. It's, uh, it's a sound, it's a historic sound walk designed by a Tehran based theatre group who used to do street performances, but during COVID, because that wasn't possible, started to design these online um, audio performances. Um, and these these um, the, these audio performances reimagine the sounds of a particular area of the city during uh, that this particular one is reimagined during the constitutional revolution of 1905 to 11, based on historical records and narrated from the perspective of a contemporary witness. So the one hour audio file can be downloaded and listened to while walking in those streets. Um, and in this one, for example, sounds include uh, the sounds of the uh, bombing, the June 1908 bombing of the Parliament building by anti-constitutional forces supported by Russia and Britain. Um, and if there had been time, I would have played an extract, um, but I can send the link later if anyone's interested, although it is all in Persian. Um, I've participated in this walk remotely via WhatsApp and have also joined the Sonic Tehran team for other sound walks that I'll describe in a, in a moment. Um, in fact, the next slide uh, is one is a walk that we did uh, a few months ago. I participated remotely. Um, this is from from our website. Um, again, it's all in Persian, and we're in the process of translating uh, these walks. We're building up a series of um, online um, walks that people can can do. The image at the bottom, incidentally, is of candles um, in one of the churches in Tehran. So visiting the church was part of this sound walk. In fact, the sound walk that we did was on Easter Sunday um, and, and members of the team visited the church on that day. So finally, um, just a uh, uh, final point, I, as a result of working remotely, I've come to think about what I call the sonic entanglements between cities. So I walk the streets of London whilst listening to the sounds of Tehran. And of course, all of this just, you know, to reinforce is all um, enforced because of the particular circumstances of only being able to uh, work remotely. So I walk the streets of London while listening to the sounds of Tehran. I conducted simultaneous London Tehran sound walks and even a three way sound walk between London Tehran and Ottawa, where a network member is based. And it was the latter three way walk that prompted me to think about the colonial and neo-colonial historic and sonic entanglements between these three capital cities. Um, which sort of brings me back to my opening statement. So particularly in, in terms of the relationship between London and Tehran, how might, um, how might one understand the sounds of Tehran as entangled with uh, those of other cities? In the case of London, for instance, it's easily possible to identify events and decisions that happened there that had profound and long-term impacts on Tehran and its sounds. Okay, so moving away from thinking about sounds in one particular space, but how sounds in one place impact on another. Okay, so the final slide is just my thank you for listening. So it's still rel relatively early days. I think when I started this project, I had no idea quite how 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 wide open it would become. Um, and it's this is very much a project in process. So I will just stop here and thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, so we have some time for for discussion. So I'll ask uh, Gassia also to, uh, when you're able to, to turn on your camera. 
here we go and i will remove the spotlight and oh wait a minute maybe i can spotlight you both ah after all this time you know you would have thought that we'd be much much better at zoom than i apparently am um let me try that and then let me try also spotlighting loudon i had this kind of an idea that oh no yes i can i can spotlight us all i had this idea mistakenly that uh, i could only do one person at a time okay here we are um, so again, I would invite folks to uh, put questions in the chat or to raise your hand. Raising your hand uh, puts you in my view. So that signal there um, kind of kicks you off of the many, many screens of, of boxes we have here and then makes it possible for me to see you. So if you would like to speak directly, I, that's perfectly um, fine. We do have a, a question to get us started and a couple of questions. And, and one I think would be on all of our minds, Laudan, um, just how are your research people on the ground in Tehran? How are they doing? Are they safe? Are they experiencing difficulties with the current protests? Um, I mean, it's been very difficult contacting people because, as you've probably heard, you know, there's 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 been internet shutdown although it has been possible to be in touch so i am in touch with a few of them as far as i know everyone's okay um amongst the so i i recruited 15 research assistants last year of whom only three were outside and the rest were inside iran but during in the, within the last 12 months about more than half of them have left to pursue postgraduate studies outside iran actually so there aren't so many of the research assistants still still in iran but there's a wider network of people we have about 80 people on our whatsapp group who are involved and people who come to our net monthly meetings so as far as I know, everyone is okay, and I have been in touch with some of them. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's a very difficult time at the moment, for uh -huh. sure. Um, uh, Sahan Datari asks, uh, thanks you for the great presentation, and, and, and asks, are you interviewing people about their sonic memories in the urban areas of your interest? So it sounded like you are talking to people about that yeah. issue of memory. And I wonder you know, if you could address that, and then maybe we can open up to this this broader um, issue of memory and sound that that seems to be something that is you're both dealing with. Go ahead, Lan. Uh, yes, thank you, Sahan, for your um, comment and question. Yes, absolutely. I mean, ethnography is what I do. You know, that that's kind of um, my starting point, really. Um, I, I'm not trained as a historian. In fact, all the hist the new kind of get, getting into the historical stuff is a new experience for me. Um, so, uh, absolutely, I'm interviewing people um, about their sonic memories and I'm also, through the research assistants, they are also uh, doing interviews with friends and family and so on, so I'm able to draw on that. And part of, part of the pleasure of this project actually has been working with these young people remotely, mainly, um, and being able to, uh, in a way, train them up in ethnography as well, because many of them have not... Um, had that kind of experience before and so you know listening to their interviews and then giving them feedback so it's been a learning experience i'm also uh conducting a series of interviews with my research assistants as well um, because this is a book project and i actually want to write about the network itself and kind of more distributed methodologies um but i yeah i think it's really interesting and raises quite a lot of eth ethical issues maybe um but um for me it was quite important that the research assistants also in a way i've never done this kind of um interviewing where i'm you know i've always interviewed musicians before i've never done it this is more of almost like a kind of oral history project and to, to interview people that you don't really know very well particularly i'm trying to talk to elderly people because i'm trying to capture some of those memories of of um you know the 1940s and 50s for example and I found that quite a kind of tricky thing, I have to say, um, that, but, but getting the research assistants to talk to older members of their family in a way it is easier to capture those memories than if they were to talk to a complete stranger like me. So I think this distributed way of doing interviews is quite good. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm talking too much. I'll let Garcia <laughs> also have an opportunity to talk. 
No, thank you for that. And, and Gassi, I wonder if you have something to add about this this notion of, of dealing with memory and history when then looking at urban soundscapes. Hmm. Well, first of all, thank you again, and thank you, Laudan. I think it's a really important intervention that Laudan is making in terms of thinking about the entanglements between cities and how the political situation and condition and uh, in one city can really affect great changes in another. And, you know, I think traditionally um, studies of urban soundscape, which are city focused, are really thinking about a, a city almost as if it's kind of happened, existing in a vacuum, um, which of course no city does. And so I think that's a, you know, really important uh, intervention. Um, yeah, uh, I guess in terms of sonic memories, of, you know, and sound walking, I, I mentioned the piece that I just uh, completed drafting for um, Jacek Smoliki's uh, book, which is coming out, I think, next year on sound walking, and it's he's taking a historical um, approach to this, um, and so I was really interested in as I mentioned, you know, experiences of uh, survivors of the Armenian genocide who had gone through the death marches, um, their sonic memories basically within the oral testimonies. So there was an Armenian ethnographer called Virginia Sabazlian, and I drew a lot from her work, which I actually also frame as sound walking because this is an extremely contested subject. Um, this is happening at the, you know, um, transformation of the Ottoman Empire into the Republic of Turkey, the Constitutional Republic of Turkey. And um, uh, it's still not today uh, permitted to speak about the Armenian genocide in Turkey. Uh, you can still be jailed. And in fact, people have also been killed um, for speaking about it publicly. Uh, you can't recognize it. So what uh, Virginia Sivazlian did, and not to dwell on this for too long, but I think it's interesting for us to think about she actually went from village to village, uh, starting as an undergrad student uh, for 50 years uh, and collecting the testimonies of survivors. And, you know, this was in Soviet Armenia. Of course, the survivors, they're people who are already pushed to the margins of society. They're, you know, hard to reach in any other way. And she can't take public transport. She can't be public about her research, actually. Um, so it's only published much later. But she gathered uh, hundreds of testimonies and so it's looking at those testimonies where I'm looking at specifically experiences of the sonic uh, during the genocide um, and you know you can learn so much I think actually from yeah kind of, of what people felt um, because a lot of those experiences particularly a lot of them are children at the time who survived um, end up being things they're listening to also because they're hiding so uh, anyway so I just think you know there's many ways in which this idea of sound walking can be extended and probably many archives you know like this that we don't even necessarily traditionally consider a sonic archive um, and yeah in my current project I'm also thinking about death cities and that's the kind of link to the cities kind of cities where indigenous populations have been expulsed for example through war or genocide yeah wow um, we we have a, a a question from forgive me if I murder this name Lassen Tutalar a really exciting talk so question for Gassia in relation to memory I think you talked about some sounds being absent. In your research, what did you capture about that? What was absent speaking sonorously according to your informants? Uh, thank you so much uh, for the question. And um, yeah, in the presentation, I guess, in terms of thinking about sounds which are absent, um, you know, I was responding to this critique of online sound maps of cities uh, by Jackie Waldock, who is saying that, you know, what is often being documented is this male dominated um, kind of uh, terrain of sound. And so it's kind of the sometimes female voices, feminine perspectives or female perspectives, let's say, which are missing from some of those 
uh, sound maps, but also you can think, of course, Anna Raimondo, she's, um, you know, creating sound maps that are specifically feminist um, and thinking about, you know, why are women excluded from certain city spaces and don't feel safe, for example, or um, Alison Martin, who's doing the same thing with kind of the displacement of you know, urban Black populations in Washington, D.C. through gentrification. Um, yeah, so I'm thinking about those sounds, which are missing sounds. And then my research team, uh, Christabel Sterling, Ruth Bernatek, Matilde Marelesh, they're doing this, um, you know, very in-depth study right now of sonic experiences um, of residents in London, specifically in Brixton, which is itself undergoing this incredible, you know, very rapid gentrification and population uh, shift and thinking to their, you know, what sounds are missing um, as populations are shifting. And also kind of, you know, how are historical sounds sometimes used in ways to touristify or kind of commodify a place and sell it to newcomers? Um, how, how can sound be deployed and soundscape be deployed in that way? Because of uh, Brixton's, you know, very rich musical heritage uh, and reggae music and dumb. So, um, they're looking at that through interviews with residents there. Wow. Thank you so much. We, we have just a couple of minutes before our, our break. Um, I wonder if anybody else has a, a burning question. And if not, I wonder whether um, Loudon and Gassia, you have a response to each other's talk, whether there's anything you wanted to add. I think you're you're extending this idea of so many methodologies for um, uh, for doing sonic ethnography and and also for our understandings of what the, even the enterprise is, how we deal with affect, with history, with um, interdependence of people and technologies and places, with with this again this kind of um, intensive relationality among all the factors that, that are present in in the environment that you're studying. That's me riffing. So I, I, I'll leave the last words to you. Um, I mean, gosh, I've lo a lot of things that I would like to say and discuss with Garcia, but I think one of the things that um, that that both our you know our projects have have a lot in common actually. But this, I think, one really important thing is is this thing about alternative narratives and. Um, um that's absolutely central to what i'm doing and i i, I think gussie is also um doing the same so yeah just thank you gussie it was really really interesting yeah and it's uh, same for me Laden. i think you know our projects share a lot of resonances and i think that's something you know you and i are discussing which i'm you know, really grateful to be able to do that with you um for me you know your approach to thinking about decolonizing methods is really important um uh, particularly as for example um uh, matilda Norellis, she's a field recordist and sound recordist in my um in the sound cities project and you know she's thinking about that a lot in terms of uh, how do you do field recordings, particularly of um, public spaces and communal spaces, shared spaces, etc., without kind of subscribing to some of the appropriative, extractive, um, you know, tendencies and impulses that have driven some of that kind of recording practice. Um, so, yeah, I think it's important to think about these kinds of ideas, like how can decolonizing methods be, you know, brought into the kind of sound studies um, and sonic arts practices and discourses. Uh, so, yeah, it's just, I, I appreciate you kind of pointing us towards those um, yeah, ways of thinking. Thank you both so much. And and thank you, Gassia, for your offer to uh, to add your bibliography to the list of resources. I'll take a moment maybe just to point out that on the website for this symposium, uh, we do have a, what we consider to be an evergreen list of resources that um, a wonderful graduate student, Sergio Parra and Dr. Valentina Bertolani assembled this summer. Um, and and really it's a starting point for for kind of gathering contemporary approaches to music sound and environment and uh, so if anyone has resources they'd like to add they can send them to me at mssc at carlton.ca and i'll put that email in the chat